think students are going to, again, they're going to learn at different paces, at different levels throughout the whole entire year. And when we are assessing those and we are using average, and I'm a science guy and I like to use averages, but that's not necessarily the best way to judge a student's mastery of a level of content. If a student's struggling at the beginning of the year with a certain topic, but they show growth and they show an increase in that, that concept or that mastery level, then why would I be, a, be taking the overall average if they're at a higher level at the end of the year than they were at the beginning of the year? And that's excellent, that's growth, that's where we want, we want them to be. So I, why should I penalize them for an average their, their struggles at the beginning of the year when that's not really showing what they know? Taking the average uh, would can, can hinder the student because if they have a couple bad games uh, or assessments, then it's gonna be very difficult for them to catch up. So at the beginning of the semester, they're finding their groove. They're unsure of how to prepare for something, they're, and they don't do well. And then at the end of the semester, you know, they're they're in their groove. They they've got the fifth grade, their schedule, their routine, everything's down, and they've figured out how how their expectations. Um, we can show that, hey, I, I didn't know this at the beginning of the semester. I've proven that I've, I know it now. Well, average doesn't account for that. Average is going to take in, oh, I didn't know this here. I know it here. So now it, I'd much rather go with what, what, can you, what have you done for me lately? What's your most recent display of knowledge as opposed to worrying about something that you did in September or August when the fifth graders are very wet behind the ears? There's just overwhelming <clears throat> so let's do or what the most recent display of knowledge as opposed to you know combining them all together when they do really really poorly on one particular assignment you know if they have if they just don't understand how to balance equations and they get that one out of four on that assessment but then they can understand they can predict the type of um, chemical equation it is and they can do molar conversions and they can do all the steps afterwards they just struggle with that one if you factor in that one poor con like if you if you factor in that one lower assessment the piece that they struggled with that's going to bring their average down so even though they mastered you know five out of six of the concepts that one that they didn't quite master is going to bring the overall average down versus looking at it and saying they mastered five out of six hard chemistry concepts this is wonderful this student actually knows how to do a lot and so that's where you know taking an average just isn't fair to the student the average or the mean it doesn't it's not an effective way to figure out a child's grade when you have Outlying outliers like didn't turn in something have a zero or a 50. Um, when we look at data in any type of study, we always look at what are the outliers. And so you have to ask yourself if they've got one grade that's super high and everything else is lower. Well, what 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 is our trend? What happened here? Or if there's one very low score that's pulling a grade down, but everything else shows achievement, then you have to say is that worth keeping in. So when we have research, we always look at outliers. So why wouldn't we do that when figuring a child's grade? Well, I know that for, for my language arts class, one of the big places I would talk about would be reading comprehension. If I am looking at a student, I want to see growth over time. If a student starts off poorly in a particular area, like reading comprehension, and then builds on that over the course of the semester or time length that we're looking at, I want to see that growth. If I am giving straight percentages, and let's say they go uh, from a zero to a, a 25 to a 50 to a 75 and a 100, they've shown real growth over that time. If I averaged that out, it would come out to a really low D. And I don't think that's what the student has demonstrated over time on that. I want the student to learn, and so I want to look at how he or she has developed over time. Taking an average of that doesn't do that. So now I can look at those scores and determine when and what kind of trends the student has shown as far as learning and gaining mastery. So as I just mentioned with the zero or the lower grade they have a very difficult time to recover 
the other piece that I think about, and this would this would go in all subject areas, but I'm thinking about science in particular, we have a lot of different topics that don't necessarily correlate with each other. So in science, they they um, every student takes physical science and life science throughout five through eight. And when you start to lump all that together, that really takes away what we know about how a child can perform in certain areas. For example, in physics, usually math is, an pretty, is a pretty important skill that they have to have in order to be successful in that area. Well, maybe we have a struggling math student that is also struggles in the physics area, but they can really shine and make those connections in life science. So now we can see the strength in that student and we can see the weakness in that student and it's again it's a better communication tool um, for teachers, parents, and students.